Greetings. Today is the 11th Sunday after Trinity, the 20th of August of 2023. The service was pre recorded on Friday, the 18th. Participating in this service, reader, video photographer Shane Donnelly and myself. Independent Methodist Church was founded on 9 11 of 1988. This September, we observe the 35th anniversary. The entire month will feature special events. A letter will go out this week to the congregation and to the friends in the community with all the details. Also, this information will be featured on our website. If able, the Cyber Congregation is invited to join us for the celebrations. Thank you for making us part of your day. This is I Will Bless from Genesis 12, verse 3. I will bless those who bless my people. I will curse those who curse them too. For this I have promised to my servant Abraham, I will keep my word. Lord, we bless, Lord, we love your people. Lord, we bless, Lord, we love your land. We weep for, we pray for, we intercede for Israel. Lord, please now move your hand. Welcome. We are anticipating the 35th anniversary of this church. And we're talking about things that we have done in the past and how things have changed over the year. Last weekend, we looked at the church mouse. And as part of the children's sermon, we receive an offering from the children. And this weekend, we're looking at the offering. And the first offering plate basket container that we had in this church was this woven basket. And we had four of them. And we used them at the very first service on the 11th of September of 1988. Now, baskets for receiving offerings are mentioned in the Bible. Now, today, we no longer use this when we take a collection. We are using this when we collect the empty cups from Holy Communion. But during the pandemic, when we tried to decrease hand contact with one another, we use this form of the basket that has a handle. So it would be passed by people. Same idea. You often see these in a Catholic church. Now there's another kind of offering. And this is typically what we use. It is a brass plate. Some churches don't have a basket or a plate. They use a purse. And it has handles. And you pass it from person to person and you put your money in the bag. And then other churches, they have a bank. They have an offering box, and they can be small or they can be big. All four of these are mentioned in the Bible. In the Bible, they took offerings different ways. And we're going to discuss what these mean. Well, long ago, people did not have a lot of money. They exchanged goods and services by barter. All right, I give you this and you give back to me something else. So when they gave to the Lord, they would give the produce, the harvest from their garden and their field. And people would take grain. They would bring fruits, olive oil and different things. And it was their gift to the Lord. All right, so when we use a basket, we are bringing to mind the ancient Israelites bringing their agricultural harvest 
to the temple. Now, in the Bible, there were animal sacrifices, and people would bring sheep and goats and pigeons and cows and oxen, and they would be sacrificed. They would be butchered, and the meat would be placed on brass trays, all right, by the priest, all right? So the brass plate often found in a church represents the animal sacrifice. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus, when he went from place to place, they had to buy groceries to eat. They, they had a need for money, and that Jesus had a need for an offering, and that people would come to him and want to give a donation. And that Judas, Judas Iscariot, was the man in charge of collecting the money. And that Judas had a purse. And that the money would be put in the purse. And of course, it had a string, so it wouldn't fall out. All right, so we do know that in the ministry of Jesus, he made use of a bag, a money bag or a purse. Then we also find there's a story of a widow, and she was very poor. The only money that she had were two pennies. That's all the money she had, and she gave it to Jesus, and that she walked forward, and she put it in a money box. Those were in the temple. So you didn't have one way of receiving the offering. There were different ways, but all people would give because all people in some way have been blessed by God. And so we appreciate your support here and the giving that you do. And, of course, Reverend gives you a gift every week. And as I said, when you go around and you shop, the shelves are filled with Halloween merchandise. And guess what? This week, you're going to get Oreo Halloween. Enjoy and have a good day. I'm reading from the New International Version Bible. Scripture and verses from the Old and New Testament related to the monetary support of the Lord's work. The Word of God as found in the book of Genesis, chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Continuing Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 12, and verses 20 through 22. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and all that you give me I will give you a tenth. Deuteronomy Chapter 15, verse 10. Give generously to him, and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and everything you put your hand to. Continued on in chapter 16, verses 13 and verse 17. Celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacle for seven days after you have gathered the produce of your threshing floor and your wine press. Each of you must bring a gift proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. 
Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. The Gospel of Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. The book of Acts, chapter 12, verse 35. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian church to do. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. This is the word of the Lord. The Flip Wilson Show was an hour-long variety show aired on NBC from 1970 to 1974. For its first two seasons, it was the second most watched program in the nation. The African-American funny man had a comedy routine as the Reverend Leroy of the church. Of what's happening now. The flamboyant preacher liked to strut around the pulpit with his hooping and hollering, and a predictable catchphrase heard again and again was, the devil made me do it. The Reverend Leroy did not hesitate to bring up the topic of money matters. PTL was interpreted past the loot. Maybe you can recall the segment when Reverend Leroy announced that with God's help, we can see the day when this church will go from crawling to walking. And the deacons responded with, let the church walk, Reverend, let the church walk. And then the church begins to walk, the church can begin to run. And the choir shouted, let the church run, Reverend, let the church run. Reverend Leroy got revved up. And finally, the church can move from running to flying. Oh, the church can fly, but of course, that's going to take a lot of money to make that happen. The congregation grew quiet, and after a prolonged silence, one of the church mothers in the front pew mumbled, Let the church crawl. Let the church crawl. As evidenced by Flip Wilson with his humorous episode, it is no joke. Any mention of fiscal giving in church world is likely to create a wall of resistance. I learned a long time ago that some of my flock have fled from churches where the minister or priest repeatedly scolded, shamed, and even threatened 
their constituents for more money. Mark Twain, author of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, admitted that he was so sickened by a long harangue for money from a pastor that he retaliated by not giving what he had initially planned, and that when the plate went by him, he lifted a dollar. Because of these pushy preachers forever twisting the arms of the reluctant, begging for more money, I have shied away from discussion of this vital spiritual subject. Please be at ease. I am not a pulpit bully about to give you a full Nelson and a body slam, endeavoring to make you part with your cash. This message seeks to focus on our reasons for supporting the Lord's work through a local community of faith. My observations of 50 years in the pastorate and the policies operative in this parish. I am into faith raising, not fun raising. If one first gives himself to God, all other giving is easy. St. Augustine of Hippo, theologian extraordinaire of the ancient church, wrote, Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. And his primacy in our existence is reflective in our checkbook. Sam Houston, the Texas freedom fighter, as a precondition to marriage to a very pious Baptist girl, accepted Christ as his Savior, submitted to baptism, and joined the church. Before being dunked in the river, Houston removed his watch and chain and was about to take out his wallet from his jeans. The parson interjected, Sam, keep your wallet in your pants. It needs to be baptized too. Rick Warren, of the runaway bestseller, Purpose Driven Life, made the following appraisal regarding financial giving. We easily miss the spiritual growth significance of giving money. We need to give the first part of our day in meditation to God. We need to give the first part of our week in worship of God. We need to give the first part of our income to God. We need to give the first part of our social life to fellowship with other Christians. Each of these four kinds of giving keeps our mental compass focused on God's direction. Remove any one of them and spiritual growth slows down. My job description as a pastor is to discern where a sheep is on his or her spiritual journey. The mission is not to leave the sheep at the starting line. Babes in Christ have to get off the formula, move on to drink the milk, and proceed to digesting the meat of the word. Many people do not increase their level of giving unless they are challenged in a non-confrontational way. Fiscal donations to a church or to an auxiliary group such as the Salvation Army and the City Rescue Mission are wrongly perceived to be paying dues to a religious organization where one shared responsibility as a participant in a group. An offering is a tangible way of expressing our recognition that we are in a mission station with a divinely commissioned assignment. The monies we place in the alms basin reflect our beliefs that we desire other men, women, children, and youth to know, love, obey, and serve the Lord Jesus Christ as we do. We are not simply underwriting an administration of religious goods and services. We are actively fulfilling the Great Commission. The coins and currency support a church's worship, service, and outreach, part of a global network spanning the ages. Again, my task as a servant of God is not getting my hands into an individual's pocketbook, 
but getting Jesus Christ into one's heart. Holy Writ declares, Behold, I make all things new. The former things are passed away. With Christ in our life, he brings transformation with a change in attitudes, values, and actions. This list of former things passed away includes a dissolution of a self-centered existence of me, myself, and I, and a preoccupation with accumulation. Charitable giving to an ecclesiastical body, like a church, or to any worthy cause, education, relief, research seeking to eradicate a disease, and the arts, is a tangible way of expressing our gratitude to Almighty God. Baby boomers in this assembly will recall that as part of the opening exercise at Sunday school, the custom of a birthday box. Whoever had a birthday the past week walked forward as happy birthday was sung and placed the number of pennies for his or her years in a plastic bank molded to look like a birthday cake. One would think that the honoree would be given a gift. Instead, the child was challenged to make a donation. The birthday bank monies were earmarked for foreign missions. The tradition has disappeared, but its design was an acknowledgement that life is a gift. The boy or girl, by the grace of God, made it through another year. Thomas A. Beckett, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was martyred at the altar 40 days after Christmas in 1170 at the cathedral. His life was immortalized in the movie Beckett, starring Richard Burton. When Beckett was a little tyke, his mother would weigh him in a basket on his birthdays. Then she filled the container with money and food to the identical weight of her son. Next, she would go and share his good fortune and joy with the poor. If we imagine that we have received nothing from God, then I suppose that we would lack an incentive to render unto him a spirit of thanksgiving. If we are self-deluded into thinking that our station in life and everything we have acquired is due to our own ingenuity and effort, or that we deserve everything that has come our way, there is little basis for gratitude. Years ago, there was a nationwide controversy over an irreverent statement made by Bart Simpson. Bart said the blessing before the Thanksgiving Day dinner. It went, Oh God, thanks for nothing. Why should we be thankful? We paid for all of this food ourselves. Contrast that with this amusing story. A well-known radio announcer took his daughter to a church supper. The minister invited the little girl to say the grace, and she agreed. She bowed her head and prayed, This good food, all you people should know, is coming to us through the courtesy of our sponsor, Almighty God. Around here, we lip-sing with gospel troubadour Andrea Crouch. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me things so undeserved that you gave to prove your love for me, the voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude, all that I am and ever hope to be. I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory. The standard of measurement for giving unto the Lord in the Bible is the tithe, or the 10% of our income. Wrongly, some Christians hold to a viewpoint that the 10%, as other Old Testament rules and regulation, were intended for ancient Israel and remain binding on Jews, but followers of Jesus are exempt from these stipulations. As you heard read in the scripture lesson, the tithe was an operation long before Moses and the covenant. 
endorsed by the patriarchs Abraham and Jacob. Methodists, as part of their Anglican heritage, hold to the view that Christians are under the spiritual and moral legislation of the Old Testament, whereas we are not required to embrace the ceremonial obligations. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. From the Ten Commandments are moral demands. God has not changed his mind. Jews and Christians are to conform to these requirements. The prohibition from eating pork, sausage, and bacon is a ceremonial decree enacted for Israel. Gentile Christians with a newfound freedom through Christ, eat ham on Easter. A question for debate. Is the tithe a ceremonial or a moral precept? One thing we can say for sure, it was in effect before Moses, and it is a gauge for us to determine an amount for giving. I did not begin to tithe until after I had entered the ministry. When I was a boy, I was given two nickels or a dime to put in my own church envelope, and as I got older, I graduated to a quarter. By mid-adolescence, I was working odd jobs, and I placed a dollar in the basket. It might not seem like much, but back in the 1950s, A Snickers candy bar cost five cents. I bought this Snickers on sale for a dollar twenty-nine. So my two Snickers, when I was age eight, were equivalent to two dollars and fifty-eight cents in today's terms. Maybe you are not tithing. Maybe you once did and you cut back. Maybe you are in deep debt and look upon tithing as out of the question. But a relevant question for reflection, has your percentage of giving witnessed any increase over time, especially pertinent with rampant inflation? One of the most popular children's sermon series I ever presented was on the Christian founders of major corporations who were tithers of their millions, investing in the kingdom and a blessing to the people of God. The large open Bible on the lectern was printed by the American Bible Society. The 13 colonies did not have a Bible printery. All Bibles were shipped from the UK. After the Revolutionary War, Americans needed to have their own source for producing the Book of Books. William Colgate, with his soap, shaving cream, and toothpaste factory, and with a few other businessmen, founded the American Bible Society. There are 75 million Presbyterians on the planet. The largest concentration of Presbyterians is the U in the USA, is Western Pennsylvania. What country has the most number of Presbyterians? South Korea, with 9 million. How did that happen? In part, through the missionary enterprise of the 57 varieties, H.J. Hines. He funded untold hundreds of missionaries out of his own pocket to carry the gospel to the Far East. To this roster, let us include Thomas Bramwell Welsh of the Grape Juice Company, William Proctor and James Gamble of Ivory Soap, cheesemaker James Kraft, and Henry Parsons Kroll of Quaker Oats. These entrepreneurs were men of faith, and as their as their corporations prospered and expanded, from their profits invested large sums for the advancement 
of making Christ known. These CEOs were not a jump start of the prosperity gospel, cracking a deal with the Lord. You give to me and I'll give to you. The name it claim it, health and wealth gospel of the Razamataz preachers has as its underlying premise to get from God, as if ever the gift could be preferable to the giver. One of these money-grubbing preachers promised seven answers to prayer for every $70 sent in to his ministry. Is that how it works? Joke. How do you hide a $100 bill from a televangelist? Place it in their Bible. They'll never look there to find it. Giving to God is not motivated to earn favor, impress, out of guilt, to cancel sin, or to manipulate. The primary objective is adoration. Conference speaker Gary Chapman, in his Five Love Languages, instructs us that there are five ways that humans communicate love. Words of affirmation, deeds of service, quality time, physical touch, and material gifts. And these five ways are utilized with our devotion to God. And our offering is a material gift. And it is a truism. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your bosom. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. I have said before, and I say it again. I do not have great wealth. I live very simply, and I am not high maintenance. But I regard myself as one of the richest men in Newcastle. Twice, I got embroiled in a heated discussion about receiving monies from individuals whose income attainment was of a questionable source. During my student pastorate, a widow had been given the cold shoulder from her former church. Her late husband had owned and operated the tavern. She sold the bar and came into a lot of money and was told that her offerings were not welcome. At another parish, a man won big time in the lottery and desired to finance the athletic equipment and uniforms for the church baseball team. If you haven't noticed, permit me to bring to your attention, no alcoholic beverages are served at social gatherings in this facility. There has never been a raffle, a bingo, or any game of chance. Historically, Methodist piety forbids intoxicating beverages and gambling. What about the shopkeeper who sells cigarettes and other tobacco products? Shells featuring adult magazines. The landlord who receives rent from properties purchased by sheriff's sale evicting a family from their residence, dividends from stock in an overseas corporation exploiting workers with a bowl of rice and a tar paper shack. Does it matter where offering money comes from? And the answer? The wise men brought their precious treasures to the Christ child or pagan astrologist. Mary and Joseph did not refuse their gifts. To reject an offering is to reject the person giving it. Methodist ministers are disallowed denying anyone Holy Communion. We strongly encourage one to be baptized. One should receive the sacrament of initiation before coming to the sacramental table. But anyone desiring the body and the blood of Christ are welcome. And why this permissive policy? 
I cannot read what is going on in a person's head, mind, and soul. And with a presentation of a monetary gift, who am I to question the motivation of the benefactor? This congregation is to be applauded for its good and faithful witness of supporting the work of Independent Methodist Church. I need to stress that in recent years, we have seen a prevalence of death. And when one of our members dies, his or her contributions die with them. Also, this congregation has as its official policy the Levitical tithe. This is a scriptural principle. In the Old Testament, the Israelites gave 10% of their harvest to the Levitical priesthood. The priest, in turn, gave 10% of the 10% to help the poor and the needy. What some of you may not be aware, a year ago, when there were devastating floods in Kentucky, a large check was mailed to a home in Hazard County. By way of the Samaritan Purse, the relief organization of the Billy Graham Ministry, monies have been sent to reach out to the worn, torn nation of Ukraine. Our church government has authorized me to respond to emergency need, and nearly every week I receive calls for money. And my first question, did anyone in my church tell you to call me? I have new Bibles on hand. If anyone crosses our path and asks for a copy, one is given free of charge. As we travel from congregation to congregation, there exists wide variance as to how the offerings are received. No collection takes place at a synagogue. Jews annually contribute to the temple from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, the High Holy Days. No Eastern Orthodox Church receives an offering as part of the Divine Liturgy. Catholics and Protestants have made use of a public offering by passing the plate. A little girl in church for the first time watched the ushers pass the offering plates, and when they neared her pew, the youngster piped up so that everyone could hear, Don't pay for me, Daddy. I'm under five. Methodists have the tradition derived from the Church of England that plates are handed to the ushers by the acolytes. When filled and brought back, the pastor receives them, may offer a brief prayer. Sometimes there is a choral response. The doxology has been sung to accompany this presentation as we praise the God from whom all blessings flow. The intention of this ceremonial among Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, and Episcopalians is to stress the dedication of ourselves with our tithes and offerings. Increasingly, common is online giving through a church website. Mega churches have a giving kiosk for electronic giving, and don't forget, there is a fee attached for this action. The new trend of digital giving has a definite plus. The donor has an agreement to make regular payment. It is easy to fall into the habit of a hit and miss giving. The downside of credit cards, debit cards, and automatic withdrawal is that offerings become a private activity performed in isolation. Most of what we do is a communal action. Why is the offering time relegated to a solitary function? The contemporary church has a half hour of standing and joining in a sing-along. Is it okay that I enter the assembly when this preliminary is over? Or, I like the music, but I don't want to sit through a half hour or longer sermon. Is it all right for me to cut out 
after the praise. My review is the churches want to be cool and with the in crowd and jump on the bandwagon and whatever is new without thinking through these innovations. The good Lord has given us two hands, one to receive and the other to give. All are to give because all have received from his bounty. When we go to heaven, the Lord is going to make known to us how our giving increased his work in the world. Thank you for giving to the Lord by Ray Boltz was the 1990 Christian Song of the Year. When Mother Teresa of Calcutta heard the song, she requested that it be sung at her 1997 funeral broadcast aired to the entire planet. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad that you gave. One by one they came, far as I could see, each life somehow touched by your generosity. Little things that you have done, sacrifices made, unnoticed on the earth, in heaven now proclaimed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, say shalom, bimrama. Oh, ya say shalom, aleinu. Liyako Yisrael. Liyemru, liyemru, amen. Ya say shalom, ya say shalom. Shalom, aleinu. Liyako Yisrael.